All right. Hey, I want to invite you to be seated. And I want to tell you another story. And if you want to turn to your Bibles in the Gospel of John. Some of you know this story, but um, I think it's um, uh, one of those days that I just feel like telling you the story about also after the resurrection, after Jesus had resurrected. He appeared several times. He appeared on the road to Emmaus and there at the, 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 lo- the lodging place in Emmaus. But um, every time Jesus appeared, he appeared to all the disciples and different people except for one guy. One guy, his name was Thomas, right? And so Thomas, many people call him Doubting Thomas. I guess that's fair. It kind of stuck with him. But Thomas said to the other followers of Jesus, hey, unless I see it with my own eyes, and put my hands in, on his hands and feel those, those ruined hands the nail hole, where the nail holes were. Unless I put my hands where the spear got him in the side. No, nah, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Thomas gets a lot of grief for that. So um, the story goes is that one day, one day while the disciples were together in a locked room, that Jesus came and he stood amongst them. And he suddenly appeared, right, supernaturally, kind of like a burning bush. He stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Don't be afraid. And he talked to Thomas. He said, all right, here I am. And so Thomas, Thomas, at Jesus' instruction, went over and he felt Jesus' hands. And he put his hand on his side. He put his hands on Jesus. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Now, what, a, a lot of, what you don't know about Thomas is he went forth from that moment. And for, for, for the next 72 years or so, give or take a few years. He was a powerful witness and a powerful missionary and apostle. He ended up in India. Now, we're back, we're talking about 70 AD. We're talking about 1, 2 AD, right? He he ended up in India, and he was telling people about Jesus and telling people about um, what Jesus was about and why they needed to follow Jesus and the ways of Jesus. And he must have been really, really good at it because he converted a lot of people in India, and then he was accidentally killed in 72 um, A.D. He was killed accidentally, and so they buried him there, and there's a, there was a shrine there. And for hundreds of years, it was Christians as well as Hindus and well as Muslims that took care of Thomas, the guy that unfortunately we call Do- Doubting Thomas, and we kind of smirk and snicker at. But his lesson's powerful. Once he laid hands on Jesus, or let me put it this way, once he had an experience of Jesus, once he had experienced Jesus, man, he was on fire. Fair enough? In fact, he had what, what's been in my head all week, this idea of having a, having a fire in the belly. Right? How many of you have ever heard that saying before? You ever heard it? Participate with me. Nope. Some of you haven't ever heard that, huh? Wow. Wow, it's brand new. Fire in the belly. Now, I don't mean indigestion, right? Last night at Camp Pictured Rocks, we introduced something new. We, uh, we're experimenting with what we want to do in the Brat Booth um, at the county fair this year. And so I said to Chris, to, to Bear, I said, let's do bacon-wrapped bratwurst. Huh? Does that sound good? So we did break, bacon-wrapped bratwurst last night. And last night at worship down at Pictured Rocks, I asked the same question to the folks that were there. I said, have you ever had a fire in the belly? And I don't mean because you ate too many bacon-wrapped bratwurst, Right? I don't mean gas, that variety. I mean a passion. Because when we talk about fire in the belly, and that's what I'm talking about this morning, that's, that's what I mean. Passion. Have you ever had a passion to do something? And specifically on the do part, you know, the, the act part. Because the way to understand fire in the belly is passion. You're passionate about something. And I don't mean lovey-dovey, huggy-bear, kissy-poo, romantic passion. Y'all with me still? Okay? I mean a drive. You're driven, driven. It's a passion. It's a fire in the belly. It moves you. It pushes you. It stirs you. It shakes you, and it calls you to act. That's what I'm talking about. Let me tell you a quick, quick story. Um, I heard this week I was at a, a, a revival missionary meeting um, at the Independent Baptist Church here in Dubuque, and it was fun. Um, I was invited to go um, from one of our CDM, our, our preschool staff. I said, I'll honor that. I want to go, and I went, and I took Alec with me. And uh, because he's a seminary student and he needs to learn that, he needs to find out that, that uh, people say amen to you and it's good, it's all right, right? And um, so we went. And I heard this story, great story. It's a story the preacher told about uh, uh, a Marine, a young Marine uh, that wanted to be in the Special Forces, the, the um, Force Recon. This morning we had a retired Marine at the 8 o'clock celebration, and we talked about this a little bit. He, this guy, the story goes, wanted to be in Force Recon, like the elite the elite of the elite Marines, like the really tough guys, the guys, the, the recon guys. And part of the test to
to do that. There are a lot of tests to see uh, who's going to make Force Recon. One of the tests was a swimming test, and so these, these young guys, they've got to be in a swimming pool and hold a 15-pound brick above their head, and they've got to tread water for an hour or two hours, whatever it is. And the deal is that if the brick, if the brick goes underwater, you're done. You're out. You're out of the program, Okay? Okay? Can't, can't do it. And there was one young man that was not a good swimmer. He, he just wasn't a good swimmer. And he was struggling and he was struggling and he was struggling. And he would go down and he would come back up. And he would go down and come back up. And finally he went down and he didn't come back up. And the brick stayed above the water for a while until this guy drowned. Okay? And then the rescue divers pulled him out. They pulled him out and they brought him back. And the Marine Corps said to this young man, you get to be in Force Recon. Now, why? why? Why did he get to be there? So I was fascinated by this story. He said, he got to be in Force Recon because the people in charge of Force Recon said, you know what? If this dude's willing to die for a 15-pound brick, we bet that he's willing to die for his teammates and the other people in his platoon. Amen? Does that make sense? And they said, and this is what grabbed my attention, this guy has a fire in the belly to be a recon Marine. And that story really impressed me. I said, whoa. That's what we're talking about, somebody that's passionate, somebody that's driven to act, not just talk about it, not just think about it, not just go through the motions, fire in the belly. I really like that concept. Let me bring it back down for us. I'm going to give you a couple of examples because not all of us are going to be called upon to tread water for an hour with a 15-pound brick. Fair enough? Let me give you a few more examples. I remember, um, I remember meeting somebody in Lamar's, Iowa. When I went to Lamar's in the year 2000, um, I met one of my new church members. It was a big weekend. It was a busy weekend. I had just moved in to be the new pastor there. And so um, they had a celebration going on in Lamar's. And I don't know if you're familiar with Lamar's, but that's where they make Blue Bunny ice cream. Did you know that? And if you like ice cream, then you would like living in Lamar's. If you really don't care about ice cream that much, then you will learn to hate ice cream. And that would be me. Okay? Because we had ice cream all the time. And the folks at Wells Blue Bunny are wonderful. And it was a big weekend, 4th of July weekend. And I met this guy named David Hawkins. And David um, introduced himself, said, I'm going to be one of your members. Um, hey, you know, um, you, you just got to town. Um, uh, I, I'd like you to come out and look at my tractor collection. I collect John Deere tractors, right? And so I'm thinking... Oh, man, I've got so much to do. I just moved to town. Like, really, do I need to go out and look at these 16th scale or these toy tractors? And David was a great man. He died a couple years ago, and I regretted I couldn't go to, to his funeral. But he was persistent. He was like, no, no, really, preacher. I, I, you know, um, I really want you to come out and look at my collection. I really want you to see it. I only get it out. I only get my collection out like every two or three years. And I lived north of town on the farm, and I was like, okay, I'll go. And so I went out there, and it wasn't that. It was this, right? He had 30, 30 perfectly restored John Deere tractors sitting out on his lawn, and he had five or six others in the shop. And I got to know David, and um, um, I would, while the time I was in Lamar's, I would go out every, every now and then and, and help him. He would work on these John Deere tractors. He went all over the United States, and, and he would like say, okay, I need this particular model of tractor, and he would find it, and it might be in, you know, it might be in Indiana, it might be, you know, out in New York, and he would take a trailer out there and come back with a trailer full of junk, Right? And he would, he would lovingly get into it and restore it. Point. Passion. This guy had a passion that caused him to act. He didn't just say, yeah, I got a collection of John Deere tractors and go out and look at a bunch of little toys on a shelf. Something I thought about saying, yeah, David Hawkins, God rest his soul and may he be in heaven with perpetual light. This man was driven. He had a fire in the belly that was deeper and wider than just being interested. You all with me? It wasn't just that he was like interested. Or like, yeah, I kind of like those tractors, and when I see one, maybe I'll get one, maybe I won't. I don't know. It's no big deal. He was driven. Passion. Fire in the belly. Most of you in this room can actually think about a time when you had a fire in your belly. Really. Maybe you haven't ever put those to that equation, 2 plus 2 is 4. But let me tell you, some people, you know you had a fire in your belly once maybe to get married. Seriously, some people, you know, they get a fire in the belly and say, that's the one I'm going to marry, and I'm going to do everything I can and do it right and do it perfectly, and I'm driven, and I'm passionate, and I'm moving, and I'm shaking, and I'm acting because um, I want to marry that person. Maybe you had a fire in your belly to finish school, right? high school, college, and you were driven to do it, you were acting on it, you were all in, you were consumed with it. Man, I'm going to finish school, or maybe it was get a job. Or I've known people, I've known people that had a fire in the belly to overcome cancer. Ever know anybody like that? 
I've known people like that that said, I am driven. I am consumed by this. I am not going to let this cancer get me down and kill me. Know anybody like that? Yes? Thank you. Anybody else know anybody else like that? Yeah? Yeah. That's a fire in the belly. And maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's somebody that gets a fire in the belly because they said, this heart thing isn't going to keep me down. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to do what I need to do because I want to live. That's a fire in the belly. And some of you in this room know that. I've known people that had a fire in the belly to get sober or to get off drugs. Man, and you watch that and you see somebody and they are passionate. They are all in. They're consumed. They're on fire. They're going to get clean. They're going to get sober. You can fill in the blank. But here's the deal. That's what we're talking about. Fire in the belly. Being, being all in. Now I want you to ch change gears and turn a corner and start thinking about your spiritual life. Because we are in church and this is what we talk about. What about, what about having a fire in the belly when it comes to your spiritual life and being a follower of Jesus? Because see, there is a difference between those who are, who are on fire and, and consumed and, and truly all in and those who are going through the motions. you all believe me about that? There's a difference. There are people that are all in, and I don't mean, don't take this to an extreme. There are some people that worship, and, and they like to, you know, stand up and say amen and, and, and get slain in the Spirit and speak in tongues and all that. That's fine. But I'm not talking about that. Now, if that's not your thing, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being all in, and you can be all in and be passionate in a quiet behind-the-scenes way. Don't miss that. See, Jesus, listen, Jesus needs more people with spiritual fire in the belly and he needs fewer people that just have gas. You with me? Really. He needs fewer people that just have indigestion. He needs more people. Jesus, not me. Jesus needs more people that truly have a spiritual fire in the belly and aren't just playing church and going through the motions. That's what he needs. The living body of Christ is the church. And I'll say, hey, that's what the church needs. Last week when I was introducing Kim Myers, I said, um, I gave that statistic that I've been, I've been reading, doing some research. And a statistic that says 80% of the churches in the United States are stagnant or dying. 80%. 80% of the churches in the United States are stagnant or declining and will soon die. And most, not all, but most of those churches, if you ask them, why are you declining? Why are you stagnant? Why is really nothing going on? They'll say, well, we don't have enough money. We just don't have enough money. We can't, we can't pay for things. We don't have enough money. Um, or they'll say, well, we don't have enough people. It's the same ten people that do everything. It's, it's, it, we just don't have enough people to teach Sunday school and Bible school and usher and greet and count money and be leaders, you know, and be on the ad board and, and be on the trustees and whatever, whatever. I've heard all these stories, and you can read all these stories. And here's where I push back on that, church is that when I hear a church say, well, we're stagnant, we're declining because we don't, have enough, we don't have enough people, we don't have enough money, I say, nope, I think you're wrong. It's not a money problem and it's not a people problem. You've got a faith problem. Now, a lot of people don't like me to say that, right? But I mean it. Or for our purposes, I say, no, church, you don't have a money problem. There's plenty of money. There's plenty of money in your pockets and in your bank accounts and in your vacations and in your cars and in your houses and all the other stuff that you have. There's plenty of money to do, to, do, to, to do church and be church. And it's not a people problem. It's a fire in the belly problem. And I believe that. It's a spiritual fire passion. I am all in. I'm not just going to play church and go through the motions of church. I'm not just going to treat church like another good organization like the Lions or the Kiwanis or some club that I'm in. See, that's the problem. It's a fire in the belly, love God, love others, serve the world problem that's killing churches all across the United States, and that's a fact. But they blame a scarcity of people and money. Well, right, even rats leave a sinking ship. Amen? And when you've got a church um, that, that, that there's a spiritual intensity problem, a passion problem, right, there's not going to be any people or money. But that's a symptom, not the cause. You all still with me, church? Fire in the belly. You know, John Wesley, when he started the Methodist movement, because we are, originally we were a movement, not a church. We were a spiritual movement, Methodist. We should claim this. Methodism was a fire-in-the-belly movement within the Anglican church to fire it up and get people going on this. And John Wesley said to his preachers and his leaders back in 1780 or whenever it was, he said to them, look, you need to catch on fire with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and people will show up just to see you burn. Isn't that a great quote? 
I've always loved that quote. What was he talking about? He was talking about, in your own way, preachers and leaders, be a burning bush. He was saying, catch on fire, be consumed, be driven, be all into this, preachers. And because his preachers and the leaders, not just the preachers, the leaders took him seriously and caught on fire and had a fire in the belly for the gospel and for taking it into all the world, we're here right now. If they hadn't taken that seriously, we wouldn't be here in the United Methodist Church. And I mean that. They took it seriously. It's about getting a fire in your belly. So I'm going to ask you again, do you have one? Do you have a fire in the belly that's driving you to do something in the name of Jesus Christ? And I'm really specific about that. Do you have a fire in your belly that drives you to do something in the name of Jesus Christ? Do you have a fire in your belly that's different than just indigestion? Let me give you a couple more examples. I'll give you an example right here in this church. I don't know if you know Ruth Like. Anybody know Ruth? Do you know Ruth Like? Ruth Like has a fire in her belly and is driven and is passionate and is consistent in, in her drive for prayer ministries and member care ministries. She has a fire in her belly and she's right here in our midst. And I mean, she is driven to do this. You know, the first time I met Ruth, first time I ever talked to her, um, the moving van had just left my house in Waukee, Iowa with all my possessions, right? And so I went back to my church in Waukee to tell my staff goodbye and so forth because I was moving to Dubuque, okay? It was a Tuesday, and I was supposed to be in Dubuque on Wednesday and really kind of, you know, be here and officially be the pastor of Dubuque the next week. And Ruth, like, called me. And, 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 and I was at the church. Um, I was at the church saying goodbye to my staff, and the tornado sirens started going in Waukee, right? So I drove back as fast as I could because Alana and Emily... <clears throat> They were down in the basement. They were scared, and the tornado sirens are blowing, and I ran downstairs and trying to get them calmed down, and my phone rang, and it was Ruth. Hey, Tom, you don't know me. This is Ruth Like. I'm up in Dubuque. Yep, I'll tell you what, Ruth, the tornado sirens are going. Can I call you back? Yeah, you can, but listen, real quick, Bev Kiefer's in the hospital, and I'm just wanting to know, do you want me to see her, or will you be up here tomorrow to go see her? Ruth, I'm not even the pastor in Dubuque yet. Can you just give me a break? Well, I just need to know. She was persistent, and I told this with, to Ruth the other night, so I'm not making fun of her. I'm using it as an example to say somebody who's passionate. I mean, like, it could have been Wizard of, the, Wizard of Oz time, like, I'm in the tornado, like, I'll get back to you, Ruth. And she's going, no, please, call me. Will you go see her? Passionately. That's real. Man, I'll tell you what, her husband, Mel, like, if you know Mel, maybe you don't know Mel. Mel's 78 years old, and the fire that burns in his belly is to serve God's people through this church. He's 78. Every single Wednesday, he's in here setting up chairs for Wednesday worship. Some of you didn't know that. So this whole thing, like, well, I've done my time. I'm too old to do that. Baloney. Mel Lyke's 78 years old, and he has a fire in his belly to serve God through Grandview United Methodist Church. And I see him do it every single week. And he's quiet. He doesn't say much, and you'd never know it. So I'm going to say again, what's the fire in your belly? What is your passion that drives you to do something in the name of Jesus? What is the passion that drives you to love God, love others, and serve the world first before love self? Before get my way, before comfort, right? What is it? That's the challenge I give to you. I know what mine is. I know what my passion is, um, and, and um, it's, it's never changed. It's been consistent. I preached about this this morning at 8 o'clock, and there were some people at 8 o'clock that came up to me, and they said, I remember that very first time that we met you. I remember that very first time our staff parish met you on that, that Thursday night sitting in here, and you know what? You're... you're yeah, you're still consistently the same. And I know what my fire in my belly is because it hasn't changed. And my fire is to help create a healthy body of Jesus Christ called a church right here. A healthy body of Christ that fearlessly says yes to doing whatever it takes to change the world. That's the fire that burns in my belly. I'm not that hard a person to figure out. And that was true when I came, and it's still true today. What I'm saying is an example of, I know what pushes me. I know what drives me. I know what, what, what shakes me and calls me. And I'm far from perfect. But I know, and I'm really confident that that's what I'm all about. And some people confuse that confidence with arrogance. And that's too bad. Because it's not arrogance, it's confidence. Because I believe that's what God has, has sent me to do. And I'm asking you the same thing. What is your passion and what drives you? What is your fire in the belly? I know what mine is. And I know that my fire in the belly, again, is to have a spiritually healthy crew of this ship that points our bow outwards and goes and reaches people who are not yet here in the name of Jesus Christ. I know for sure 
And after celebrating my 49th birthday this last week, I'm even more sure that I really don't have time to play church. I know that God sent me here to help build something to help, not do it all myself, to help build something in the name of Jesus Christ. And in fact, I'm so certain in that, that that's what allows me, that fire in the belly is what moves me to fearlessly push you to name and decide what your fire in the belly is. Are you with me? So if you came today thinking this was just going to be comfortable time, that this was going to be, let's just tune out of the sermon time, I'm sorry, it's not that. It's a push to say, you, what is the fire in your belly in the name of Jesus Christ? You see, that's what God intends. God did not send Jesus into this world to set up a club. He didn't send Jesus into this world to set up a little society where people all kind of look the same and smell the same and like each other and go to the same restaurants. I don't think that was his intention at all. God sent Jesus Christ in the world to redeem the people, to redeem us, me, you. God sent Jesus here to bring us into a closer relationship with God, period. And God's intention was that there be healthy, vibrant, alive things called churches that will be the hands and feet and face of Jesus Christ in the world. I don't think God was interested in a club. Can't believe it. I stake my life on it. And so I say to you, if you're not engaged in serving God, and if this whole idea of love God, love others, and serve the world seems new to you, I invite you to embrace it and to consider it. And if you really aren't serving anywhere right now, see, we don't leave this alone. We'll help you with it. But you've got to be willing to say yes. Because, you know, this isn't a consumer deal. We're used to, you know, go to Walmart, buy what you want. Right? Customers always write, Burger King, have it your way. That's not the way we work here. We have lots of opportunities for you to serve in the church. There's a few of them, for example. There's a few opportunities for you to say yes. Your work, church, is to look at this and say, what fire is burning in my heart? What am I driven to do? What am I driven to do that's bigger than me? What am I driven to do that's not just about me? There's a partial list of things that we can begin to do. You know, I was thinking about it this week and said, well, you know what? If you were going to name the fire in the belly for Grandview United Methodist Church, um, if you're going to say, hey, Grandview United Methodist Church, that whole church, here's the fire in the belly, what would it be? What would it be? I was talking to the staff about this. I said, what do you think? Somebody said, well, probably kids, kids and education. I said, really? Then how come we have to beg for, for uh, Sunday school teachers? Huh? That's not a fire in our belly. How about mission? Hmm, maybe. I think we're getting there. We're after getting there, but I don't think we're there yet. See, I'm serious about this. Very serious. Fire in the belly. What's yours? And maybe I'm leaving out a piece here. Maybe I'm leaving out the lesson of Thomas for you because I realize that you may not feel this and you may look at a list like this and say, man, that's for somebody else to do. I've got other stuff to do. Other people will step up and do that. I don't need to do that. Other people will give their money to the church. Other people will give their time. Well, you know what? Here's the thing, and this is the next challenging step, folks. Maybe it's the lesson of Thomas. Maybe you haven't laid your hands on Jesus Christ. Or for our purposes, maybe you haven't experienced the living Jesus in your life. And if you haven't, if you haven't, I want to encourage you and I'm going to pray for you to experience the living Jesus in your life because we know what happens. We know what happens when people experience the living Jesus in their life is that they get moved and stirred and shaken and they jump up and they go and they rock and roll and they serve God and love God, love others and serve the world. And that's a fact. And so what, what I say to you is get connected. Get connected. At Grandview, we're really specific about this. We've tried to make it as simple as possible. Full participation in celebrations, worship, and in study of some kind, cell group, Sunday school, um, uh, uh, one of those kinds of places where you interact with others and learn. And what's the third one? Serve. See, God works through all those things, and that's where we experience the living Jesus. It is. And so I say to you, get connected. If you're really, really struggling this morning to answer this question, the question I ask, have you ever had a fire in your belly, specifically a spiritual fire in your belly for God? If you're struggling with that, then, then maybe it's a connection problem. And maybe you don't want to hear that, but i got to tell you that. So I'm encouraging you to get connected. 
I'm encouraging you to really truly get connected in ways that you haven't before. Because when you encounter and experience the living Jesus in the presence of God, you won't be able to help yourself. According to your gifts and experience and abilities, you will want to serve. You will want to, and you'll catch on fire, and you'll be on fire, and you'll be driven to do it. And no matter what I say or anybody else says, if it's of God, you're going to do it. You are. And so I don't know. You name your burning bush or keep looking for it. And when you see that burning bush and that call to do something besides just take care of yourself, you have a choice to make. What are you going to do? Put out that fire with excuses and reasons and justifications? Or are you going to pour some gas on it and make it burn brighter? That's the final thing that's up to you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when God puts the burning bush in your life and calls you? What are you going to do? Fire extinguisher? Like Moses? Not me. I'm not smart enough. Call somebody else. I haven't got time. I don't like the pastor. He's arrogant. Is that your fire extinguisher? How about gasoline? Make it burn brighter. Only you can answer this. I'm going to invite us to be in prayer right now and give you the opportunity to begin praying about it. Let's pray. Lord God, you know us as we are. We can't fool you. You know the sins of our hearts and our heads. Lord God, you know our excuses. You know all of our justifications and our elaborate, our elaborate reasons for not serving you and loving you. Lord God, I pray that you drive through all of that junk and you touch our hearts and our heads this morning. And Lord God, I pray that you help us to say yes to you, to say yes to you for today and tomorrow. I pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you send your Holy Spirit to fire us up, move us, and Lord, help us to be fearless, to know that it, if it's of you, you'll fill in the details. I pray this for everybody in this room. And I pray, Lord God, that you hear our prayer, that we pray in one voice, the prayer that Jesus told us to pray to you as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.